Hello Year 10, welcome to not only my classes but the other classes that I will be teaching biology to through YouTube. Uh, so we're looking at, um, interestingly I had just recorded a, a video, it was along the lines of the animal adaptations whereby I showed lots of video clips and then we wrote notes on them and I tried to upload it to YouTube and unfortunately I don't think it's worked that well because um, there were video clips in there and so I'm now doing the short version of this so that you can view it because I don't think you're going to be able to see the video that I made this morning and have uploaded. So we're looking at plant adaptations. Earlier on in the topic we looked at the um, things, the resources that plants compete for. We said they were light, minerals, water and space. Um, the ones that have maybe the best features, so you know long roots, wide roots, um, you know wide spreading roots, um, big leaves, those sorts of things, they become the winners, they are the best competitors and the losers we don't make it so we never get to see them. So here's our title for today, how do plant adaptations help them compete for survival? So uh, let's get our books out, let's write our title down, how do plant adaptations help them compete for survival? Now there'll be times when I go too fast, maybe you need to pause the video to catch up, there'll be times when um, we are working in real time and I give you that opportunity like I am now for you to get your title done um, and we shouldn't need to pause the video. Okay, so we're looking at adaptations of plant leaves. Let's have a little think. Maybe there's someone at home you could talk to um, about some adaptations of plant leaves, looking at that picture. Um, if you want to pause now and have that conversation, you can. If not, I'm gonna talk you through some of those features. So the plant leaf has a waxy cuticle on the upper surface. This prevents water from being lost from the leaf. You can see there the droplets of water. You probably know from geography about drip tips and these can redirect the water down to the roots. We've got the veins there that comprised of the xylem and the phloem. The xylem carrying the water and the minerals and the phloem transporting the sugar all the way around the plant. The leaves are very thin so that the light can get to as many cells as possible. Um, they've got a large surface area like so many things we talk about in science, we talk about a large surface area. Um, they never overlap each other and they have this green pigment. So inside the chloroplast we have the chemical chlorophyll which is um, where the leaf becomes green and it absorbs the light to enable photosynthesis. If you want to add some notes now to your book, maybe a list or a spider diagram, do so now. If you want to pause, pause now. Okay, so this is um, a plant called marum grass and it's found, as you can see on the picture there, in sand dunes where it's very dry, very exposed, very windy. And we know from our work in B1 and B4 that on the underside of the leaf we've got the guard cells which surround the stomata and although they are primarily there for gas exchange, um, water can escape through those stomata. So what this leaf has done to try and reduce that water loss is it's curled up on itself. And this section here in, in the center is actually the underside of the leaf. So it's trying to reduce its water loss wherever possible. Quite a clever adaptation. We have here some of our succulents, such as the aloe vera, the yucca and the cactus, and they are able to hold on to and retain as much water as possible with this really waxy, strong cuticle on the outer side. We're not actually writing any notes at the moment, we're just listening. We know a lot about the cactus. Again, it's got that waxy surface to prevent water loss. Narrow spines are actually the leaves, so they've taken enough light in order to photosynthesize, but being so small, they reduce the number of stomata, therefore the water loss. They have roots that can either go very deep into the ground or can go very widespread. Um, and that enables them to either get water that's very deep down into the ground or as it does rain, uh, when it rains, the water is absorbed by that large root system. A lot of these things I've already talked about on here. If you want to pause to read this more, you can. But the small leaves, the waxy coverings, the spines and the prickles uh, and the root systems and also in the leaves, the fewer stomata. So that's just kind of a summary 
we don't need to write any notes at the moment. Now, what I've done on the original video that I made this morning is I showed you some video clips with David Attenborough, and unfortunately, I don't think that YouTube um, likes that, so this is why I'm doing the uh, shortened version, which is unfortunate, really, because I think if you saw the animal adaptations last week, they were quite good videos. This video here on the a giant Amazon water lily, which we're going to write some notes on, they have um, lily pads that are six foot across, okay, so it's taller than you know, a per an average person, I suppose. And they have these edges that roll up so that they kind of float on the water full of all these air pockets, um, trapped air so that they can float. So we wrote a couple of notes about that, or we tried to when I did the first video. So you can add those notes now. And if you need to pause, pause now. Next, I looked at the pitcher plant of Southeast Asia. These are found in Borneo. They're about a foot tall, so about the, the size of an A4 page. And um, although they're a plant, they are full of um, kind of juices that can dissolve insects, okay? So it's really slippery inside this kind of pitcher, so like a big jug, um, and insects go in and it's really slippery, so they fall in and they become dissolved and the nutrients absorbed by the plant. And David tells us how um, one was actually found with the body of a drowned rat in it, so you can imagine just how big they are. So again, we wrote notes on that, and if you'd like to write some notes now, you can. If you need to pause, pause now. We then looked at the Venus flytrap, which was tiny by comparison to the other things we've talked about. Um, it had these fine hairs that when an insect walks inside it, it triggers the hairs and then the Venus flytrap closes and again dissolves its prey, absorbing the nutrients. If you'd like to write some notes, pause now. We then talked about seed dispersal and all we need to write in our book here is a subheading, seed dispersal and all of the capital writing information. So we know from our dandelion clock that we used to blow in um, the summertime and uh, sycamore seeds that rotate and spin like mini helicopters as they hit the ground. They are good ways of spreading seeds by the wind. Mini explosions talks about pods that as they dry out, they twist up on themselves and then they pop open, flinging the seeds in all directions. More often than not, animals eat the seeds and they move to a different location <coughs> and those seeds are lost through the faeces. And then we've got larger uh, seeds such as coconuts, which can be tra transported by the water. You often you see the coconuts um, coconuts land on the beach, they get swept into the water and transported to new locations. So in our books we're writing seed dispersal, wind, mini explosions, animals and water. Again, I, I think because I've already filmed this video once today with the um, short video clips in, I am doing kind of a fast version because I'm keen to get it onto uh, YouTube for you to use. So if you are finding that on this occasion I'm talking a bit fast, then please pause it and catch yourself up. I feel like I'm running against time a little bit trying to get this video made. Okay. Okay, moving on. Now sometimes to cope with competition, plants actually just don't compete. They grow at different times of the year, so they don't have to compete. So quite often we see in the woods, uh, coming up anytime soon now, kind of April, May time, we see the bluebells and the snowdrops, and they grow before the leaves come back on the tree, so they don't have that competition. And different root systems can access different aspects of water, maybe the higher up water in the ground or the lower water with the deeper roots. We then looked at a fig tree, and this one was where just one single seed of a fig tree can land, and it uses an existing tree in order to um, kind of use it as a structure to grow off, really. And it becomes so powerful and grows so big that the tree that it was using for support ends up um, not being able to cope and dies off and then you've got this giant lattice of fig plant all around it 
So if you want to write a note on that one, you can, but you don't have to. If you need extra time, pause now. And then the last thing that we're going to look at today is the um, this exam question. Okay, I'll read it to you. Organisms compete with each other. Figure one shows two types of seaweed which live in similar seashore habitats. We've got sorac on the left and bladderwrack on the right. Most of the time, the two seaweeds are covered with water. Bladderwrack has bladders filled with air. Bladderwrack grows more quickly than sorac. Suggest an explanation why. So we can see that we've got these bladders filled with air. It's a three marker. Have a little think. Okay, see what you can achieve and write out your answer. I'm going to pause for a moment myself so that you can do that. You might want to consider uh, the effect of the air filled bladders on photosynthesis. Might be something to think about. I'm going to look at the um, mark scheme now, so if you need extra time, pause now. Okay, for the first mark we can say that because it's got those air-filled bladders, it will float, therefore get more light. You could say as well that the water at the top is warmer and that the bladders contain more carbon dioxide because they've got the trapped air inside. One mark. So because of those features, there will be greater photosynthesis in the bladder rack than in the saw rack. And then as a result of extra photosynthesis, there'll be more glucose, there'll be more starch, so therefore there'll be more um, production of proteins and therefore more growth. So that comes to the end of our lesson. It is a lot shorter than it will be on a standard day because like I said, I've lost those video clips and I'm just trying to get this lesson posted so you've got something to work with today. So next lesson, we're gonna be looking at some six mark questions, applying our knowledge of animal and plant adaptations. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, quadrat sampling later in the week, which is a required practical. Okay, hope you found it useful. Enjoy your day. Thank you.